a key responsibility we all have as engineers is security and restricting access to data. And while it's definitely not the most glamorous part of the job, it's definitely one of the more important ones. And like a lot of things in data, this can get really complicated if you let it. But what I want to do in this video is explain four very simple roles that you can implement so you can have a better understanding of how these can all work together in a complete architecture or just have some inspiration for something you might want to introduce on your own team. Before actually writing code or implementing any roles, it's important to understand who's involved in the first place. Who are the different users that are going to be interacting with our data. So here's an overview of a typical simple data architecture. And let's talk about the different users involved. First, obviously, we have developers. These are the engineers. These are the people who are day to day building out our data infrastructure. And that might be you or people you're working closely with. Next is the analysts. This could also be stakeholders. These are people who are typically interacting with the data that you present from the outside. So maybe they are connecting to the data and creating reports, or they just want to export some data, stuff like that. We're going to call those people analysts and group them over here. Next, I have what's called loaders. And these are the different systems or maybe they're different tools, whatever it is that's interacting with our source systems and bringing it into the central data architecture. And then the fourth group is automation. And this includes tools like orchestration tools, scheduling tools, automated CI, CD runs, things like that. Whatever is automating different processes throughout this architecture, we're gonna group those into another bucket as well. So these are the four. We have analysts, developers, loaders, and automation. You might have more, you might have less, but I found at least in my experience that this covers most of the user bases and systems involved in our data architecture, or at least to get you started. Now that we've grouped who's involved, let's start to talk about their different permissions that we think that they should have. We're gonna start with the people over here that we've called the analysts. And what I like to do is take the name of that user group and just make that the name of the role. So in this case, I would create a role called analyst. And now in terms of permissions, we're gonna say they should have select permissions just to the marts. You'll probably run into situations where these people will want access to maybe the warehouse or the raw data. And ultimately that's up to you. But in my experience, I like to keep this limited to just select permissions on these marts here. There's no create or drop permissions. They're simply reading the data so that they can create their reports and analyze it. And limiting it this way does give you more control over your warehouse. Make sure you don't have rogue analysts creating different tables and interacting with things that are outside of maybe the core developer or development team more upstream here in these other roles. Now let's move on to the developer. And obviously the developer will also have the ability to select here. And that's why I've kept this here and highlighted it because as we'll see later, you can have one role inherit another role and actually simplify how you set things up rather than doubling up permissions. But in order for developers to be successful, they're going to need to select from the raw source data. So we want to give them read permissions over here as well. That color again is for read only, not building, not creating or dropping tables. It's strictly for developer. Again, maybe you want your developer to have more permissions, but again, if you want a general guideline, I would recommend keeping this just to select and we'll cover this later. But we do want the developer to create things and test things out. So down here in our dev environment is where the developer will have the ability to deploy and test and create, drop, do whatever they want in their own test schema or database. And that's what this purple box represents, which is basically ownership. You can create, you can insert, you can select, you can drop, you can do whatever you want down here in your own safe environment. But the other area up here is production and CI. This is a testing environment and this you can consider the rest of production. And what I recommend is giving the developer read permission to production. Not every developer should have permission to create, drop, insert data into production. Again, if you're a smaller team, maybe that is something you allow, but I do think it's a good practice to keep production off limits for most people, unless you're maybe a manager or you have an admin permission type of thing going on. Otherwise, as a general developer, I think it should just be read only access to all of these things here, but you can build and drop into whatever you want in dev. But you might be wondering how at that point do we even update production? If developers can't do it, how does that happen? And that's where the automation role, I believe is a great place to handle that because you're limiting who can touch production and you can keep an eye on all of those processes. So the automation role will inherit all of the developer read permissions and deploy down here for all of these, but they're also going to have build and deploy for everything else here. So that is the only role that has the permission to actually deploy and make changes to these production environments. And I think that's really important here, especially for security, for maintaining consistency and making sure you have things locked down. And what I would recommend is if you want certain people to have this admin permission and to do ad hoc stuff, grant that user permission to this role rather than just giving individual user access. It just keeps things controlled for yourself and for your team and locks it down so you know exactly who has permission to do what. But you'll also notice here that the raw data is still just select. Automation here isn't going to have the ability to create or drop raw data, but it can deploy and basically do everything over here in analytics. So who's handling this over here? 
that's our last role and it's the loader role and that's gonna have full permissions to do everything in the raw layer and this will be different extract and loading tools maybe data streams maybe custom apps whatever that is you can have different users but they all get the assigned role of a loader here and this helps make sure that any third-party tools or whatever processes you're building here won't be able to impact anything over here it's limited to this scope here so just to recap here are the four different roles we have the analyst role we have developer we have automation and we have loader. So now that we've seen this all in visual form, I'm now gonna go over to a Snowflake instance and show you what this can look like in a real database when it's set up using these roles. Here I am now on Snowflake and over here on the left, you can see I have two different databases that align with what we just showed before. I have an analytics database and a raw database. We have two sources being loaded here and then different schemas set up for those different layers that we've talked about before. So the first thing I wanna do is just show you from a visual perspective what this is gonna look like. So if I use the role analyst here, we can see all we see now is Martz and it's just, there's one table in here for now but the idea here is that's limited they can't see anything else now let's move to developer now developer i have full visibility to pretty much everything but as we'll see later there's certain restrictions on what we can create and delete and all that other stuff automation should look pretty much the same again because of what we remember before it has select visibility to everything but it's not going to be able to create anything in the raw data and then lastly loader we should expect to only really see the raw data and when we do that's what happens no visibility to analytics all right so let's now look at some more examples of how this would look so here as analyst again let's say we want to select from this table we can see we are getting data which is great we would expect that but what if I want to select it from staging this is not here this is a little bit more upstream as we remembered if I do that, it's gonna get blocked off and say we don't have authorization. Same thing for creating a table. Maybe I wanna create a test dim table, not gonna allow it. So that is restricting the ability for anybody who's an analyst to do that. And imagine you have different stakeholders, you can have multiple users, but they all get assigned to this role and you can make sure that they all share those permissions. Let's now move on to developer and we can see this has all updated. Let's now try to select from staging and we would expect this user to be able to, and they can. But what about if we want to create a table? Imagine you're a developer and you want to create right in production. We're considering this production. If I try to create, again, we're getting that insufficient privileges or blocked. But if I want to create it in my own dev area, dev M training, let's just say, I'm able to successfully build that. And here I can see dim test was built right here. And I can go through, drop it, whatever I want to do. Ref if I refresh this, now it's gone. So I have full access to do whatever it is I want to do inside my dev environment, but I can't do it in production. Now let's move on to automation and try the same thing. This time I'm going to actually try to create in warehouse again in the production and it will allow me to do that same. And if we look here, there it is and I can drop it. But imagine the automation here typically is going to be something like, let's say GitHub actions or airflow or DBT cloud, something like that. That's going to be an automated process. That's going to make sure you know exactly who has permissions to build in production and keep that trimmed off and maintain that security again. So you don't have rogue developers just going and doing that. Now on the other side, we still have the ability to select from the raw data. That's what this data is right here. But if I try to create a table in raw, again, I'm gonna get error. I'm not able to do that, which brings us to the last role, loader. Again, switching up the visibility up here. This role is not going to be able to select from anything in analytics, but we can create an insert and do all sorts of stuff in the raw database. So again, if I just created that here, we can see I created that source table and then I can drop it as well. So here's another way you can look at these grants too. If you're curious, you can review the grants. I'm gonna use the account admin role, but if I show the role grants to the analyst, you can see there's usage on specific databases and schemas and even down to a table. The developer is gonna have the same things here, but also usage on the other schemas in production. Again. But the only ownership is for the dev m training if you look at that here again up here as well dev m training there's no ownership of anything else but if we go to automation this is going to have ownership of pretty much everything in production and the ci and again that is what we just explained and then lastly loader same thing but in reverse ownership of everything in the raw database but we don't see any permissions or anything for the analytics database so that's trimmed down here now, before we finish this video, the last thing I want to show you is some scripts on how you could go about creating this and what that would look like. We're not going to go deep into this because it's going to be different depending on the database you use. So I don't want to get too lost in that. But as an example, here's what it looks like on Snowflake. The first thing we can do is create our different roles and we're giving them those four different names. On Snowflake, you also have the idea of warehouses, which is computation. And what I like to do is tie the computation to the role. And that allows you to, again, just keep things organized, but also be able to monitor and manage costs for those different user groups. So as an analyst, for example, 
they only have access to the analyst warehouse and therefore we can also monitor the costs associated with that same with developers so they can use the developer warehouse automation will have their own warehouse and you can monitor costs that way which becomes really helpful as things scale and you can just again keep an eye on things here's where i'm creating different users and here you can see for example maybe you're using fivetran or airbyte or stitch or it's just maybe a python user and you create these users in snowflake and assign them to the specific roles and therefore we know multiple users have the same roles and the same permissions next we have analyst user but uh, imagine this is an individual person at your company you create multiple people and each of them get assigned to an analyst role and have those permissions same with developers this would be an individual developer for everybody on your team gets one and then automation user you could have different users for let's say github actions for airflow prefect dagster kafka whatever it is you're using to automate or you just have a single user give them the automation role Here's a script to create the different databases down here i'm granting roles to users and other roles and depending on if you've created the role first or the users first will depend on if you are running these commands versus if you're just giving it a default role it depends on what comes first so my user gets all of them just because i'm an admin now this is just a quick part on hierarchy but this is actually really important because this is going to allow you to simplify your rules and make sure things flow through to one another as we mentioned before the developer inherits the rules of analysts it's just that select and then automation gets everything from developer so we have this hierarchy of sorts so if we add something to analyst that's going to flow through to both of those we don't have to copy it and so here's how you can do that again in snowflake but you can do it in other databases you grant one role let's say analyst to another role and that creates a hierarchy same thing here developer to automation so not just to users but to other roles and this is really important and is going to make your organization a lot cleaner if you can follow this now, the last parts here are actually granting the permissions. These are the very granular and specific permissions you want to give to the different roles. And this is where, again, it's going to be custom to whatever you want, but eventually you'll create that and it'll flow through to give the experience of what we had here and also align with everything we discussed here with the different roles and permissions that we outlined at a high level here before. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of not only how database roles can work, but have a simple example that you can follow for your own team or just to continue learning on your own. So if you made it this far and you found it helpful and you want some more from me, I'll leave a link in the description and in the comment below. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you at the next video.